the folks who are somewhat new to this sector, I, I, I will tell you that there's a lot of really, really good speakers here, folks who are kind of leaders in the industry. I don't count myself among them and, and following uh, Will today. It's kind of like, I feel like Nickelback and, and the stones opened for me. Um, <laughs> so, so <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I was worried about Nickelback, I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> So, so understand that you're, in the next three days you're going to see some absolutely amazing speakers. Um, so um, I'm, I'm just to be part of that, that group is, is, is pretty, uh, pretty thrilling for me as well. So I'm just going to give you a quick tour of what's going on in the quantum computing sector. There will be no block sphere um, graphics at all. Let me just tell you a little bit of hop here, and this isn't a commercial as much as kind of an explanation of how we are fundamentally a high-performance computing consulting firm. We try to understand what's going on in the vendor and user communities to kind of make uh, matches up with, with what, what's happening in the sector and how users can take advantage of that. And about three or four years ago, we started getting a lot of questions from our HPC user base saying, we're hearing rumblings about quantum computers and, and we're the, this is the community that looks at the leading edge, the pointy end of the spear when it comes to advanced computing. And they said, how can we start to think about inculcating quantum computing into our overall HPC workload capability? And so we started to really kind of think about what was this going to be in terms of how was quantum computing going to change the high performance computing sector. And just to give you kind of a quick spoiler alert about what happened was um, it became pretty clear, and let me just give you a quick definition. At, at Hyperion and such, we, we talk about the HPC community. These are the folks that do advanced modeling and simulation or, or deep learning or big data analysis on, on expensive computers, uh, high performance computers. And then we talk about the enterprise community, which is everybody else. And generally, that's the kind of compute capability that you'd see in large organizations that aren't geared towards science and engineering applications. So when we talk about enterprise, we're really talking about non-HPC environments. And what we found that it wasn't just the HPC community that was looking at um, quantum computing, it was basically the enterprise system writ large as well. They were also trying to understand what was going on and, and, and really trying to dip their toe in the water to get a better sense of how they could position themselves. I was at an IBM Think conference in San Francisco earlier this year, and um, they had a number of talks, uh, thousands of talks, uh, technology talks there at this, this three or four day conference, and they had a number of HPC talks. And right now, whether you know it or not, IBM has the two most powerful high performance computers in the world. They're like 10 to the 17th mathematical operations per second installed in two Department of Energy labs. They each cost about $300 million a piece. And when you went to IBM Think, they had a little booth on the corner uh, talking about their HPC. And I think at one point a tumbleweed actually blew by and hit me in the leg. Uh, there wasn't a lot of interest from the enterprise community. If you went to one of their many, many quantum computing talks, if you didn't get there 15 minutes early, you couldn't even stand in the hallway. Uh, this, is, this was an enterprise, or this was not an HPC or an advanced computing conference. This was general purpose enterprise, and every quantum computing talk was packed with people just trying to figure out what's going on. So it struck us that this is not just the pointy end of the spear, esoteric kind of computing that you know, we would have seen 30 years ago, a kind of Seymour Cray HPC. We're seeing enterprise uptake on this to be really impressive. And that, what that means is there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of questions. So the promise of quantum computing is substantial. We already know that, that's why we're all here today. And we're seeing lots of interesting applications in things like cybersecurity, material science, chemistry, pharmaceuticals. And the interesting thing is that the list grows every day. It's almost as if every time you look at an interesting quantum computing development, at some level, there's going to be an impact on this offers a new algorithm or a new use case, or someone has figured out a very clever way to take an existing quantum computing phenomena and turn it into an end use that matters. But unfortunately, the challenges ahead are pretty substantial. And you, you heard a lot of that from, from the professor earlier. And um, by the way, I, I will always call you professor because I did take that MIT X Pro class. It's 16 weeks and it's absolutely tremendous. And I, I recommend everybody go and do it. But if you spend 16 weeks listening to Will talk, you're only going to call him professor to his face. Uh, but I would definitely, definitely take the class. It's, it's well worth the time. Um, so the challenges are form formidable technical issues in hardware and software. Uh, the, the interesting thing is there are really uncertain performance gains. It's really difficult right now to figure out exactly what quantum computing can, can bring to the table, especially in their current state of development. It's not as if every quantum computing algorithm completely offers unobtainable, intractable performance when you're doing it on a classical computer. The jury is really still out on a number of applications, so don't assume that quantum computings win every time and win in a way that's, that's virtually unbeatable. 
The time frames right now are very unclear. It's not as if anyone is looking at a regular kind of frequency in terms of when quantum successes will happen. We haven't reached the stage yet where this is an engineering problem. It's still really basic science at this, at this point. Um, it, it's not as if anyone can come up with a five or 10 year development plan that is anything beyond um, reasonable fiction. Uh, right now it's Wild West and algorithm application progress. There's a lot of people doing a lot of experimental work in, in new algorithms and such. It's not as if there are there are places that are guaranteed to turn out the killer algorithms of the day. Um, if you look at, say, IBM um, with their, their Q experience, they're letting hundreds of thousands of people play with the systems in hopes that papers will be written, work will be done, but it's a wild west. The same with what's going on at Rigetti and some of these other places. The goal of a lot of these quantum computing developers right now is to put quantum computing capability in the hands of smart, innovative people and hope that they're the ones that come up with the algorithms and use cases of the day. It's a great, it casts a wide net, it really encourages innovation, but it's not something that you can plan in the C-suite for, for, for rolling out applications in the future. And the other thing that I think is, is, is perhaps most pernicious going forward is there's, there's a lot of looming workforce issues. There's, there's just not enough uh, quantum computing people out there right now to go around. Uh, we're going to have to have, an, have a, a major effort to train new quantum computing experts, and we're also going to have to do things like take existing folks who are in other areas of of, of the advanced computing world and, and bring them into the fold when it comes to quantum computing development. It's not as bad as it could be, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a few minutes, but it's something that, that should be in the back of everyone's mind. So this whole thing really complicates taking the QC market and, and sizing it and saying, okay, let's, what's the business case? What's the return on investment here? How can I go to my C-suite guys and say, here's what I need to do in the next three years, and this is, this is how much money we're gonna get back out of it. We certainly haven't reached that stage yet. I mentioned earlier a little bit about some of the, the hardware and software problems, and, and you'll hear a lot in the next couple of days about the idea of noise, that quantum computers are, are noisy, there's, there's, there's deep concerns with error correction. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, The Grinch Stole Christmas uh, about, about noise being something not, not really well, well appreciated. I, I gave this talk at ISC a couple months ago. It's a big HBC computing conference in Europe, and at the bottom I was talking about how in the, in the old classical computer days, when we talked about error correction, we had single error, uh, we had double error, well, we have single error correction, double error detection, which basically meant if you had eight bits, you only needed about two bits of overhead to actually make the, a system reasonably reliable uh, from an architectural standpoint. Um, and that's what we were pretty happy with in the classical world. Well, if you look at some of the schemes right now that are out there in terms of error correction for quantum computers, and, and the one I pointed to was at the very bottom there on the left, the, the O'Gorman uh, estimate that said, if you want to look at a 1,000-bit Shor algorithm for factoring a 1,000-bit RSA encryption uh, uh, prime numbers, you needed about 173 million physical qubits. And that was the estimate. And right after I gave the talk, someone came up to me and said, oh my gosh, you're being way over hysterical here. Uh, because they, someone just came out with a paper that said you could do 2048 qubits, 20, 48 RSA integers and only need 20 million noisy qubits. So there's progress being made, but it's slow and it's unpredictable. And this gives you a sense when, when you open up the paper and you see that someone says, oh, everyone's gonna be reading your mail in, in, in the next year or so because encryption has been broken. Um, we're not at 20 million qubits yet and we're not gonna be there for a while. But the issue of noise is one of the most interesting ones and it's gonna be one of the most difficult ones for the sector to overcome. So if we're gonna have to live with noise for at least a while till we come up with technical solutions, we have to get used to thinking about how to w live in this, this noisy world. And you'll hear a lot probably in the next couple days about something called noisy intermediate scale quantum computing or NISC computing, which I think happily rhymes with risk. And the bottom line here is that people have accepted the fact that noise is gonna be with us in the quantum computing world for a number of years. We have to deal with it and if we want to continue development in quantum computing writ large, we have to take advantage of noisy computers to keep the virtuous cycle of quantum computing development going forward. If we're just going to all kind of stand around and wait for a perfect noise error corrected quantum computer in 20 years, we're just not gonna get the funding. We need to take what's available today and try to turn that into a virtuous cycle generator. And that's why you hear lots and lots of talk about interesting applications and use cases and developments on machines that admittedly are noisy, but have certain 
certain capabilities. They, have, they can be used to generate certain applications, certain solutions, which of course results in revenue. So if we just look at what really are some of the key use cases in this, this noisy landscape right now, optimization is a really good example. You'll hear a lot about that, and the key there is in optimization, you don't always need the perfect answer. As long as your answer is better than your existing answer, you're perfectly happy. So you're not looking for the exact best solution, you're just looking for a better solution. You may not have the perfect traveling salesman solution problem, but if it's better than the one you have, or if you have a better way to assess someone's portfolio from a risk assessment standpoint that's better than your current capability, that's a good thing. It doesn't require the perfect solution, it only requires a better solution. So looking at applications that are basically error tolerant, where sometimes getting it wrong is, is perfectly okay. Customer affinity is a great example. If, I, if I'm trying to figure out, okay, I've got, I've got a profile of a customer, and he's got a million preferences, and I'm trying to figure out what other million, device, other million recommendations I could make to him. Um, if I get it wrong every now and then, that's perfectly acceptable. So the wrong ad pops up. So you, you, know, you go and you go, to go do a Google search, and it accidentally throws up the wrong hotel for you to stay at if you're looking at the Cayman Islands. That's something that the world can live with. So looking at error tolerant applications is another way to deal with the NISC environment. Things are hybrid applications are another really good one where fundamentally you, you merge the classical, precise, and accurate world of high performance computing with the, the noisy NISC environment to come up with something where each of those two separate elements combined to bring their best foot forward and give you an ultimately good solution. And we've already started to see a number of interesting hybrid solutions out there, the mix of classical and quantum computers, each drawing on its, its own strengths and weaknesses uh, to, to get the job done. That's, I think, a very, a very promising area. Simulation of noisy environments. If you're going to have a noisy system, embrace noise. And lots of certain chemical reactions live in a noisy environment. Drive it into the system. Use, use the noise that's there. And sometimes small is good enough. If you're going, doing something like crystalline material design, you don't need to simulate large groups of crystals because it's eminently reproducible. You only have to look at a small section of what's going on to extrapolate with high degree of reliability what's going to happen in the larger scheme of things. So again, that's something you, you, you can take advantage of. Um, we'll, we heard a little bit about it already, but one of the things about the NIST landscape that I just want to highlight is this is a warning to all the PR de PR department people who are out there, um, beware of overstating hard to define breakthroughs. Uh, I've talked to a lot of users out there and every time someone comes up and says, this has just happened, uh, there's been this interesting development and we really can't explain to the layman why this is an interesting development, but trust us, that creates a certain amount of angst in the user community. So stop with the, we've just done something absolutely wonderful that we really can't explain to you. Um, that's creating a certain degree of, it, it's not a confidence building measure, that may be the best way to put it. Um, let me just give you a quick overview of the, the quantum research activities from 50,000 meters. Uh, just to give you a sense, and this is, this is a, a real broad brush look at what's going on right now. Uh, we talked about national levels, and we could, we could go into a lot more detail about what's happening uh, around the world, but this is, I think, just a pretty illustrative case of, of, of how the world is starting to break out already. This is really nothing more than a collection of academic research papers uh, that have been published over the last decade from different countries um, based on different definitions uh, that we use to define their topics. And all this really shows you a number of interesting things. The, the chart here on the left, if you look at the two, two lines up on the top um, that, that are intermixed, that's what's happened in terms of academic research publications with China and the United States in, in computing field. Uh, and that shows you there's, there's good, strong, positive growth uh, over the last decade, but also that um, the two countries are relatively neck and neck when it comes to academic, academic production. Because the sector's new, we, the coin of the realm right now is really research output, it's not revenue. So we're, we're looking at, we feel co relatively comfortable looking at what's going on in the research community as opposed to trying to figure out what's going on from a revenue percentage, simply because this is, a, I think at this point in the development of the technology, a better indicator of what's happening. If you look at the other two lines, the purple and the yellow line, you'll see that China has much more committed to communications than the United States. A lot of this has to do with um, quantum encryption and, and, um, and other forms of secure communications that the Chinese are very, very interested in. Um, and, and I can say with, in no uncertain terms that most of the interest in Chinese secure communications interest 
started to come out right after um, a lot of the revelations came out about Snowden and what was going on in terms of the U.S. government in terms of their ability to, or at least their intent, to, to read other people's mail. And the Chinese government has made it pretty clear that that was a real instigator of their interest in looking at secure communications using quantum technology. The two charts on the right there basically give you a little sense of what's going on in terms of China and the U.S. and, and the, the third largest nation producer of academic papers right now in quantum, and that being Germany. It just gives you a sense of proportion. The, the two countries do have a, have a lead, but it's not significant. It's not insurmountable. And Germany, as part of the EU, also has a, a pretty robust development plan as well. So there's, there's certainly a sense of, and I could give you, show you a whole bunch of other charts that give you a sense that there's a lot of work going on in, in really widespread kind of ways. Um, this is, uh, I, I particularly like this chart for a couple of reasons. These are basically the top 10 quantum computing research funding organizations uh, around the world based from those academic papers. And it, I, I, I liken this to when I go to the racetrack, I, I'm terrible at picking horses, so what I do is I pick the trainers that are most successful because I figure the trainers know more about horses than I do. So if they're training these horses, they're probably better than I could ever figure out. So I look at these guys, these are the trainers. These are the ones who have the smarts to know where the best technology is actually being developed um, because they have the skill set to figure out where to place their money. What I like about this is, is first off, you see that China is, is, is basically funding an awful lot of research papers. Um, but if you go down the list, you'll see that, you know, National Science Foundation of China, then you have the National Science Foundation in the U.S., Engineering Physical Science Research Council, Council that's U.K., then we have the Army Research Office, DOD, European Research Council, a national, uh, then we have uh, s some representatives from Japan and from Canada. Uh, this, wasn't, this wasn't a self-selected list to, to, to highlight the, the depth of, of national commitment. It was basically, this is, this is an, uh, the ordered list of, uh, of participants. It shows you that this is a widespread international phenomenon here when it comes to funding of the technology. Let me just give you a quick overview of some of the commercial uh, computing landscape. These are some of the companies that you're gonna be hearing about and from in the next couple days. Uh, it's certainly not exhaustive. I think to make it any list like this exhaustive, it almost has to be updated in real time uh, because the sector is really quite dynamic. Right now, there's a wide and diverse range of hardware suppliers uh, to, to, to populate this growing QC ecosystem. We have what I call legacy players, companies who have been around for a while. IBM certainly a perennial player in advanced technology. D-Wave has been doing quantum computing and the quantum annealing alternative that you heard a little bit about earlier today for, for a number of years. Then we have companies that are use case developers, a company like Honeywell that's just really interested more in delivering a solution than they are in delivering a, a finished product to a potential end user. We have a whole bunch of new entrants out there right now in terms of hardware. There are pure play companies that do nothing but quantum computing development, companies like IonQ, Rigetti, called Quanta, Quantum Circuits. There's a number of them all exploring variants of different modalities that we heard about earlier today. It's not, some of them are, um, some of them are trapped ions, some of them are superconducting qubits, some of them are offering up different modalities that offer their own particular strengths and weaknesses compared to when we heard about those two different times, the, 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 the gate fidelities and such, uh, um, circuit depth. Those issues, each company has their own particular areas of expertise and own particular set of problems to overcome. There's some non-traditional players out there that we've, we've never seen before in the IT sector at large. Google, Microsoft, and I think last week, uh, AWS uh, dipped their toe in the water in a, in, a, in a big way in terms of saying we, we want to play in this as well. I find these players to be most interesting because I don't think they're interested in looking at selling product as much as simply making the technology available to folks as a service or using it to, to basically supplement their own in-house capabilities for, for delivering their particular product uh, to, to, to users. And there's also a million stealth players out there. I get a phone call probably once a month from companies of, of four or five guys uh, basically saying, here's what we're thinking of doing. What, how do you think this, this, this works? Is this, does this make sense to you? And, and sometimes you, you hear from them once a month for six months and then they go away um, and you never hear from them again, or sometimes things do happen, but there's an awful lot of stealth players out there right now. Interesting thing is, and I, I put this, this eye chart up here just to let you know that there are a number of software suppliers out there, and the, the two points I wanna make is A, there's a lot of them, and the number's growing, and B, they all tend to have figured out how to support a number of different hardware QC modalities. It's not as if anyone has to sign up you don't have to be joined at the hip with IBM if you're, if you're uh, a software supplier. You can uh, offer services from Microsoft or Rigetti or D-Wave. There is a certain amount of, I almost want to say, hardware and software stack forming in the QC sector that says, 
as long as we have this particular kind of interface and we adhere to these kind of protocols, we don't have to get too deep into what's going on in terms of the hardware below that line. And I think that's, that's one of the things that I think is gonna help in the workforce issue is that you're not going to have to have software engineers or, or developers who are really looking too far down the stack anymore. They can actually kind of live up high in the software realm and then let the compilers and some of the other middleware do the work of figuring out, okay, this is, this is, a, this is an IBM machine or a Rigetti machine and, and go from there. So I, I view this as a really positive step forward for the sector. So just to give you a quick sense of what I'm hearing from the folks I do talk to, both in the HPC and enterprise community, the current business case right now, for lack of a better term, is fear of missing out. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people out there who are trying to figure out what quantum is. And, and th the thing I always hear is that quantum technology is going to be a hockey stick. It's going to hit, and when it hits, it's going to hit really fast. And the fear of being left behind is, is really, it, it's really palpable out there. So there's going to be a lot of exploration. But what's interesting is the user barrier to entry right now is pretty low. It doesn't cost that much to have for, for a large enterprise to be able to dip their toe in quantum, hire a couple people to at least try to understand, kick the can down the road, engage with some of the, the software or other quantum service providers who are out there who can help you think about what to do. But it's, it's not like in, in, in the days where you had to go out and drop 40 or $50 million to go buy an HPC, put it in the basement and hire a bunch of guys. It's now a much smaller operation couple hundred thousand dollars a year just to basically understand what's going on and keep track. But you can't go to the C-suite and say, here's the ROI on this. That, that's just not going to happen. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through some of these things because I, the, the, the clock is ticking um, much faster than I hope it would. Um, one of the interesting things that I, I think people need to be aware of, and we'll hear a lot about quantum supremacy, quantum advantage, quantum practicality. I, those are all wonderful terms and I think they're interesting, but when you talk to users, and this is something we've always heard from our HPC sector, they're not really interested in the theoretical limits of what's going on out there in the real world. If you say to them, I can, I can take an application you have and run it 100 times faster at the same price, they're not going to look down the stack and say, well, I, I want to know exactly what's happened there. They're saying 100 times faster, where do I sign up? So the, so the idea of a requirement for theoretical superiority advantage, whatever, is not nearly as important as demonstrating a use case capability that gives some significant degree of performance increase that a user can understand. I can turn around a portfolio risk analysis in real time when the broker's on the phone as opposed to we're taking an overnight uh, calculation for a large customer. If you can give them that, they're not going to ask any questions. Uh, so the idea of the, let, let the theoretical underpinnings progress but look to the use cases to figure out how that affects your current workload environment. Can you do certain things significantly faster than you had before? And once you reach that point, then the argument, it's, it's all over about the shouting. Um, some other things we're hearing is that, you know, this, this, this NIST stage is not an end, but part of a process. We're, we're all hoping that someday there will be a, you know, universal gate model error corrected uh, quantum computer that, that does all the things we needed to do, but maybe not. And, and, and maybe NISC is something that we can, we can embrace fully and start to use, and, and, and it may not be intermediate stage. For all we know, this may be a terminal stage that works just as, just w as fine for everyone else. So I, I'm concerned that maybe the push towards, towards moving towards universal gate will somehow short circuit the potential of, of, of NIST capabilities for the next couple of years. Uh, and, and I find that a problem. The other thing that I'll just bring to, bring to, to, to mention is you're going to hear a lot in the next couple of days about, about different modalities and their gate fidelities and, 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 and their ability for error correction and, and, and some of their, their specifics. Understand that right now that is, as, as Will said, more or less analogous to what went on in the discrete world. You're looking at single qubit capabilities or small collections of qubits. The, the qubit modality that hits may not necessarily be the one that has the best performance at the gate level. It may be the one that has the best ability to scale. So it, it, it may be terrible at 100 qubits, but if it can scale to a million or 100 million qubits, that's the thing that really hits. So look not at individual qubit development sometimes. It's certainly important, but understand that scalability, the ability to take 
any given qubit architecture and scale it up to communicate with it, to offer up networks and pump data in and out to speak to it is, is going to become increasingly critical. So look for scalability. And always in the background, we're facing this, this, this concept of, of quantum winter or even the long-term quantum ice age. For those of us who are around with some of the different incarnations of artificial intelligence, AI winters in the late 80s was one where a lot of promises weren't kept, a lot of money was spent, a lot of people got annoyed, and a lot of people walked away. And it took an awful long time before that, that particular winter uh, ended. We wanna make sure that we don't oversell the sector, that we understand that the promises are there, but the challenges are tough as well, and the specter of quantum winter is there. It's not something that we can just avoid. And so again, keeping this virtual cycle alive is something that I think is very critical. We already talked a little bit about the workforce issues. I just wanna go very quickly about the market potential because I think I was actually supposed to talk about marketing. This is what everyone wants to see, including the, the, my boss. He said, can you just fill out this chart and all will be good? And I say, fine. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, th th this is, this is what, what I see when it comes to trying to figure out the quantum market. And the, the one on the left is, if you live on the, way, uh, the East Coast, every time there's a hurricane, they produce these wonderful tracks. And every once in a while, one of them actually goes out into, into Arkansas, but we won't talk about that. Um, the, the, and, and the chart on the right is, and is, is some numbers from, from, from some really you know, smart people who are trying to figure out exactly where the market's going to go. And, and I grade out the names because it doesn't really matter. But the point here is that if you look out a decade, you see that there's, there's a relatively wide span of what's going on out there. And, and, and really what that means is it's hard, it's difficult. This is, this is probably just as noisy environment uh, as the quantum world when it comes to trying to figure out exactly how much the sector is worth. Um, and, and ultimately, because what this means is it, it's, this, is not a, this is not a smooth trajectory because inflection points will matter. And what I did is I threw up here basically the things that keep me up at night when I try to think about a market forecast. And, and, and fundamentally what it shows is on the bottom you have this, you have this time line. And, and I, I view it as nonlinear. Uh, it, it time may move a few minutes in on one area and it may move a decade in the other. Same with, with, with revenue, a, a nonlinear scale there. And these are all the things that need to be considered or that at least can impact. And some of them are pretty straightforward. Error rates, uh, things like circuit depth, um, a, a, a qubit modality, some, some new qubit capability comes along that changes the scope. But then there's also some other externalities here that we simply can't ignore. Export controls enacted. I live right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, I apologize. And government policy can significantly change the trajectory of any interesting technology that has national security implications. And, and, and that's something that we have to consider when we think about impact on market. I look at the, the break, breakthrough fatigue. Again, the, the, the continual announcements of breakthrough that ultimately may or may not actually imp impact the market, but could contribute to a certain lack of interest in the sector that we need to, be, we need to deal about. The, the qubit paradigm shift, discrete to integrated circuits. We, even though the transistor was invented and was this, this wonderful device, it was only when discretes went to ICs that we actually were able to build the kind of systems that actually had the capabilities that we enjoy today. So we, we may be looking at another qubit. We may, we may already have the modality we need, but we may not have the exact paradigm we need to produce that to build a quantum computer of the future. So there's a whole bunch of different things out here. The, one of my favorites is we can't count out the classical world. There's going to be advances there every day. This is not a race between a, a tortoise and a hare. The, the classical computer world is making, it, is making advances, and we can't ignore the fact that, that this, is, this is a race that where the two elements are actually moving. So how does this play out near term? Uh, you know, the, everyone's looking at use cases, not just for HPCs, but in enterprise. But right now, the cloud access model looks to be short term. I don't see a lot of people putting quantum computers in the basement, except perhaps if you're maybe a national lab or two. But otherwise, we think that the access model is going to be through clouds for, for at least the near term. We're not at the Moore's Law stage yet. This is not like Intel, where you can tick top a microprocessor. Every year, we're going to up the clock rate. The next year, we're going to re redesign the core. This is not an engineering solution yet. This is still basic science. The national agendas are, agendas are a double-edged sword. Lots of money being pumped into this, and that's really good, but national innovation planned at the government level sometimes doesn't always work. Um, the governments can march you off in the wrong directions. Anyone who was around for the, the days of massively parallel machines uh, knows that sometimes governments can make the wrong choices, and that can, that can be a problem. A vibrant commercial sector is something that guarantees innovation uh, with the highest degree of potential success. Rising tide lifts all boats. This is a great, wonderful, collaborative, 
organization and group of people, uh, lots of people share information and such, that's not gonna last forever. As soon as real money starts to show up, we're gonna see a closing off. We're gonna see some stove piping. We're not going to see the kinds of collaborative activities we're seeing today. And the stack is, mer is, is maturing. Uh, but right now, vertical integration may be the order of the day. Um, and I finished with exactly 12 seconds left. They said to leave time for questions. So if anybody has an eight second question, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to hear that. Um, but th that's, that's fundamentally it. If you wanna, if you have any additional questions, uh, there's my email address and just let me know, but thank you.